So my name is Justin Lords. I'm an assistant director in the Career Center. I actually mainly work with doctoral students um, and postdoctoral scholars. So people much further, often much further along in the educational process as you. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today is interviewing skills, and I think a lot of what I'm going to talk about works whether you're having a conversation, interviewing for um, an internship, um, interviewing for medical school, um, interviewing for really anything. I think these are basic skills that are, that are incredibly useful. Um, and the goal is to really provide you with some information and some hands-on practice that will enhance your knowledge um, and comfort with foundational concepts in interviewing. So I wanna start by asking a question. At what point does the interview begin? When does it start? Yeah. Okay. At the handshake. As soon as you walk in the door. Yes. So it starts, I think, you know, you can get philosophical and say, you know, it starts, you know, right. I think it starts when you first get that interview, that first exchange. Oftentimes you apply. It can even start even before you apply for a job. But it's, it's when, you, when you meet the people and start communicating for the first time. And the reason why we, why we stress that it starts before you enter, not that entering into a room is important or having a firm handshake isn't important, but so much about success of interviewing goes into research. So let me... All right. So... You want to take the time before, when you first get the interview and they say, hey, you know, we're, we'd ha be happy to have you come and talk to us about this, this job. Um, let's do it next Thursday or something. At that moment, you really want to dig deep. You've probably already done some preliminary research into the company. Um, you probably already know a bit about them in order to put together your job materials and make you decide that you even want to apply for the job. Um, but this is a chance for you to really go deep. Um, for you to learn more about the company, about the position, to speak to people in the organization who have worked for the organization, talk to alumni, read the newspaper about relevant news about the country, to really familiarize yourself with, with, with the company. What that allows you to do is a couple things. One, you'll be much more confident um, in the interview answering questions and knowing that you're, the answers that you say will fit with what the company is looking for for its position or for its employees. But two, and I think even more important, it's going to allow you to answer really smart questions, right? So you're not at the end of the, at the, end of the interview and they say, do you have any questions? And you say, no, nah, I'm good. Or, you know, what does your company do or something really, you can ask really focused questions that show that you really understand the position, you understand the company, and you understand your role in that position, all right? So we won't get too much into the research aspect of this. Um, you could certainly, there's a ton of information on Handshake, which all of you are on because you signed up for this. Um, we have some uh, other labs on job search strategies that, that talk a lot about, about research. I mean, certainly those, especially those of you who are juniors and seniors, um, can meet with a career coach if you really want to kind of help narrowing down um, some research tools, all right? So these are some of the things that you could research, right? More about the job, mission values, products and services. Um, you know, the clientele, the organizational structure, um, salary, kind of to know what to expect in case the salary conversation comes up early on, the office culture. Any of these things will help familiarize you with what you're getting yourself into and help you answer questions to determine not only, so they can determine whether you're a good fit for the position, but whether the company's a good fit for you. Because remember, interviews are, are in many ways two-way streets. You're Hopkins graduates. You're, you're desired by a lot of companies. So you're interviewing them and want to know about them as much as they want to know about you. All right. So once you're in the interview, what we encourage students um, and really anyone when they go into an interview situation is to answer questions using the STAR method, right? Um, this is a way that provides interviewers with very clear, concrete, concise answers. It highlights what you've done, your own accomplishments and your own skills, and it really gets to the heart of your personal contributions as a candidate, right? I don't know how many, if you've ever interviewed anyone, even for, you know, sort of a leadership position or a student role, and you kind of ask them what they did, they talk really generally, and you're not really sure actually what they 
did. And you're like, okay, that sounds really cool. But what did you do for that event? What did you do for that project? The STAR method helps um, eliminate this. And most interviews that you would go through um, will have some kind of behavioral interview component. Now, if you're going for a really tech heavy research focused position, there might also be a point in the interview where you're gonna have to talk about your technical skills. So the focus will be more on technical skills. If um, you're interested in consulting, there might be what's called a, a, case, a, a case interview. You know, you're sort of given a business case to talk about. But almost every interview um, that you'll take part in is gonna have some kind of behavioral thing. And that's sort of like, can you tell us about a time that you, you know, rose to a difficult challenge, that you completed a difficult project? Those kind of basic interview questions. Um, STAR is very helpful. So STAR stands for Situation, Task, Action, Result. All right. Remember, this is going to be a quiz later. All right. So the situation. So this is, what was the situation that you or your employer was faced with, right? What's, 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 what's at stake here? Um, so maybe there was a request from your internship supervisor to prepare a report on, um, something that's going to be shared with the president of the company or the manager, the managing director of a group, right? Or maybe um, you're working at a company and you're working in their social media advertising marketing department and a customer complains about bad service or bad customer service on social media and you're asked to respond to, to re respond to this complaint. So these are the kinds of things like here's what I, here's, here's the issue that I had to respond to. That's the situation. Tasks. What did you kind of do? What were you involved in, right? So using the previous examples, it might be so your supervisor comes to you and says, we need to report that, you know, to analyze this, this segment of our, our industry, this segment of our company. I need it by Friday for, to, give to, the, to give to the CEO. Okay, so what do you do? So you, maybe you had to run reports using Excel or build a research mechanism to even get that data um, for, for the, for the, your boss. Um, for the client complaint, maybe you had to start looking at it, developing a new customer complaint strategy so that you weren't constantly responding to what was going on in Facebook, right? So what did, you know, what was the, the, the task that you had to accomplish? accomplish? And again, so it's important to say I and not we, right? Especially if you're working in an intern or in a lot of companies, um, unlike in uh, a lot of what you do here at Johns Hopkins University, where you kind of, you know, you might have homework or stuff that you do on your own. A lot of things that you'll do out in the business world or out, outside of Hopkins will be group work, that you'll work with people. Just make sure when you talk that you use I. I did this. I did this. I submitted this. I ran these reports. It was clear what you actually did and what tasks you were responsible for. All right. So what actions did you, what did you take? Again, using I. Um, so I comb through the data, looking for pertinent information to present and, and put together um, a series of PowerPoint slides. Um, I, you know, benchmark customer complaint strategies for peer companies that helped and created a report recommending um, new, uh, new strategies that the company can undertake, right? So what did you do? What specific actions did you, did you take? And then finally, what were the results? Right? What did it accomplish? And here you want to be as specific as, as possible. And you want to be, you know, if it's amazing results, don't be shy about it. Um, so maybe sharing, you know, maybe after, after doing the report and sharing it with your internship supervisor, the report was used to, um, to win a new client um, or to, um, to enter, into a new, enter into a new market. That's really cool that you were involved in kind of a big deal you know, moving into a new, new arena. Um, in the social media example, maybe, you know, the strategy that you recommended, you know, was, was adopted and represent, resulted in a 15% increase in positive reviews online, right? So not only was, did what you do was accepted by your employer, led to something new, but then you can quantify it, 15%, right? So if you brought on, and I know this is kind of, you know, this implies that you are in an internship that really allows you to do kind of big things, right? But you can use the STAR method for a lot of things. So the work that you do, um, say, here on campus in a leadership role for a club, 
you know, a lot of clubs have, you know, are trying to get new members. So you could say I was put in charge as, you know, as the vice president for marketing or the marketing chair um, for my club or the new member chair. And I increased membership in my club by 50%, right? That's, that's numbers, you know, talking about what you did and the results. This applies to not just the jobs and internships, but the things that you do outside of um, sort of any of your, any, any of your work that you do here. Yeah. I just have a question about this. Um, normally, like, for me, it's always like the title is exciting. Say, for example, I operate a hotline, which kind of sounds like a big deal. But in reality, in the two years that I've been on the hotline, I've maybe gotten two calls that actually lasted, you know, more than two seconds. Okay. And how much, excuse my friend, BSing is acceptable in like an interview? Because when they ask, you know, if I want to explicitly explain what I did, there's not much there even though I might have the skill to handle it because I was, you know, training for the role. So I'm kind of asking. Yeah, so I think I would say don't BS in an interview, right? It's easier to, it's, hard, it's harder to get called out when you kind of, you know, make your resume seem cooler than it is. But in an interview, if you say, oh, well, you know, I managed the hotline for two years, that sounds really impressive if they want to go into more details and you say, well, actually, it's really only two calls. And one right? So what you can say is, so I wouldn't BS it. I would think, you know, are there other things that you did that might not be as quantifiable, might not sort of be a line on the resume that could emphasize, you know, you would probably use that to sort of show communication skills, right? You know, are there other things that you've done that might be able to highlight communication skills? Or do you say, you know, I, I, I managed this, you know, for two years, even though I, did, I didn't get a lot of traffic, I, I, you know, you were trained, I'm assuming, you had some sort of training, you might have trained other people, you might sort of just be able to display knowledge without making it sound like you were kind of answering this hotline four hours a day for the past two years. So I wouldn't BS it too much, because you can get called out on it, but um, emphasize the other aspects that, that you'd want to do. Does that make sense? Yeah, because you don't want them to kind of follow up and realize that, oh, wait, actually, that's not the thing. But there might be other ways in which you could highlight that experience. Any questions before we move on from the star stuff? This is very helpful. It's, it can be hard to do, um, so it's worth practicing. We'll have a chance later on to, to practice a bit. Um, so this is a good example. And this is actually a very common question that you might get, right, from an employer. Um, tell me about a time you had to complete a task under a tight deadline. Um, you guys do this all the time, right? I mean, this is pretty much what a Hopkins education is, is completing tasks under tight deadlines. Um, well, I typically like to plan my workout in stages and complete it piece by piece. That's nice. It shows that you're a logical thinker and don't wait to the last minute to get things done. Um, I can also achieve strong work under a tight deadline. Once at a former company, an employer left days before a project of his, big project of his was due. That's the situation. I was asked to take it over with only a few days to learn about and complete the project. So that's your task. You're taking over this big project. I created a task force delegated work, and we all completed the assignment with two days to spare. So that's your action, and then you completed the assignment with two days to spare. And then you want to sum it up to sort of stress, I think I tend to thrive under tight deadlines, right? Um, so you can think about, you know, different answers to different questions that you might get in an interview that would respond in this way. Um, and the idea is that if you practice enough and think about the kinds of interview questions you might get ahead of time, you can speak in complete, nice, tidy, complete paragraphs like this when it's time to, to actually go into the interview. All right. One of the most important parts of the interview is, and hopefully most of your interviewers will do it, they'll wrap up with about five or 10 minutes left. And they'll say, you know, that's all the questions we have. Do you have any questions for us? And this is your opportunity to really shine. This is a really important part of the interview. It's your chance not only to get more information about them, but also to share more information about you. And so, you know, getting, asking more in-depth questions that were shared early on, asking questions about topics that might not have come up, that were, you know, involved things that you were, that you researched. 
you know, so if you're able to, you know, if you're reading about the company in the Wall Street Journal and know that they're trying to break into a new market um, that really interests you and you, that hasn't come up, you can say, you know, I'm really curious about this new market that you're trying to break into that really fits with my interest in that blah, 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 right? Um, so it gets them to talk about more about them, but also gives you a chance to talk about you. Um, and it allows you to show that you've spent time researching the company, right? So the questions you ask are really important. Um, you know, they, sh they should give uh, your interviewers a chance to clarify or expand upon something that was said earlier. Um, they should give you the opportunity to reiterate your interest in your qualifications. So it's sort of, let me ask you a question by talking about myself. Um, and they should be open-ended. Don't ask yes or no questions. If you ask yes or no questions, they're going to respond yes or no, and you're like, oh, okay. Um, typically, employers actually like to like to talk, right? The people doing the interview like to talk and tell you more, and probably have a lot more to say than they might have said in the brief introduction to the interview. Um, if you go on to uh, Handshake under Resources, I think this is probably under the Job um, Search Resources or our Vault Guides. There's a ton of information there about um, good questions to ask and how to ask good questions in an interview. So you have access to that. I recommend checking it out. They're very helpful. And the vault guides cover all sorts of different industries, you know, so um, everything, almost anything that you can think of would be there. Vault, V-A-U-L-T, vault. Yeah. All right. Any questions? This is kind of like the basic basics of an interview in the start. Questions? All right. This gets a little more philosophical, I think. So a large part of the interview and how well you perform in the interview is executive pres presence. So executive presence is combined of three different parts, right? There used to be, do they have things? There we go. So Barack has executive presence. Who's that? Joe Sandberg, executive presence. He's just dreamy. <laughs> you know, Michelle Obama. People that we recognize out in the world that always sort of seem to be put together when they speak, people listen. Um, they seem to kind of command rooms. Um, all of these people, I think, have executive presence. Many of your faculty might have executive presence. Um, people that you might look up to and admire. It's that quality of, you know, how you act, how you speak, and how you look, right? So the first part, how you act. What we would call gravitas. Um, this is what p gets people to believe in you, right? Because part of what an interview is, is you selling yourself, your experiences, your, your vision for how you want to be and fit in with the company to someone else. You want them to believe that this is someone who could really work with us and really be a star in our company, right? So it's selling yourself. It's your ability to, it's a, your ability to communicate your abilities. Um, it shows that you can handle difficult questions with grace, um, that you can, you know, that you can work under pressure, um, that you can maintain composure. Um, it's something that really oftentimes evident in great leaders. And when you think about, you know, when you're sitting down at an interview, how to convey gravitas, gravitas. think about articulating a vision that you want to fill um, and show how you're determined to achieve it. So where do you, not just, you know, that's initial job, where do you imagine seeing yourself in this company two, four, 10 years down the road. Um, being able to, you know, understand yourself, understand your goals and be able to articulate that. Um, how to develop it. Sort of surround yourself with individuals better than you, right? Um, if you're very good at something, don't just hang around with other people that are good at, good at that same thing right? Sort of figure out what your weaknesses are and develop those. You know, if you have a hard time, you know, if one of your weaknesses is humility, develop humility, right? If sometimes, if one of your weaknesses is, you know, I don't know, 
Just think about what your weaknesses are. It helps to know what your strengths and weaknesses are. Um, this sort of gets back to the BS question. Stick to what you know, right? Um, don't, you know, especially when you're interviewing at this stage in your career, don't BS, right? That, you know, you're sort of BSing about a company or about an industry. The people on the other side of the table have worked in this industry certainly longer than you and oftentimes a lot longer than you. So it's okay that they know more, right? So don't pretend that, you know, don't pretend that you know as much as they do or, or BS it. Um, stick to what you know, try to know as much as you can, but don't claim to more, know more than you do, know more than you do. And then show up, show humility, a willingness to own up to failings and shortcomings, right? A lot of interviews are going to ask you um, to tell me about a time that you failed, right? And Hopkins students never fail, right? Right? So think about that. Think about a time that you failed. Think about a time where you made a mistake. Think about a time where you were put in a position and didn't live up to your own expectations or someone else's expectations. Or you managed a project that, that didn't succeed, right? Yeah. Can this failure be completely irrelevant to the job or area that you're potentially seeking? Yeah. Right? Because the idea behind when they ask about a failure, they want to show that you are humble, that you acknowledge that you have weaknesses and make mistakes, um, and that you can learn from them. So if it's, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, so if you're interviewing, you know, say for a position in social media marketing, you don't have to tell about that time that you mistakenly sent out a tweet that you thought was, go, you know, was intended for your personal Twitter and you send it out over the company Twitter, right? That's a horrible failure. And that might not be something that you want to mention for, you know, a social media role, um, or maybe it is, but as long as you can say, you know, and since then I've, I've, I've learned, here's how I've changed my habits, right? That you acknowledge mistakes. Um, that's, I think, something to hard, that can be hard to do at Hopkins is to acknowledge the times that we've failed and made mistakes. We're sort of in a world where everyone likes to pretend that they're, 100% all the time, um, but we all make mistakes. And so being able to admit to them is going to make you come up seeing that you have humility and that, you're, that you understand yourself and your weaknesses a lot more. Um, Can you give a summary of what your biggest failure is? Sure. I'll share my biggest failure, right? Or not my biggest failure, one of my failures, right? So when I first started doing, um, I started out like a dozen years ago as an advisor for freshmen at NYU. Um, and I had like 200 freshmen at my school. And I thought, you know, it'd be really cool after the first semester to have a, to throw up into the year, into the semester party and invite all the freshmen and all their advisors and we'll get sandwiches and we'll have music. And it'll be fun. People will be, you know, they're done with the semester, get a chance to come together again. So I ordered, you know, 250 sandwiches, 250 drinks, big, booked the biggest room in our student center. You know, how many people do you think showed up? Two. You know how hard it is to get rid of 250 sandwiches? You know, like I blew my budget on this party, which I thought would be great. I was convinced that this was going to be great. Um, and luckily the, the food went to a homeless shelter, so it wasn't wasted. Um, it wasn't like, you know, the school had to close down because of my mistake. I learned a lot from it. You know, I've never made that mistake again. Um, but it, I've used that several times. So was your mistake like uh, not doing your homework? My, my mistake was assuming that everyone else was going to be as excited about this party as I was. You know, I thought this is the coolest thing. You know, and students are busy. You know, a sandwich is not that big of a draw. Certainly faculty are busy. Sandwich definitely is that big of a draw. You know, so, and I didn't understand my audience. I didn't understand, I didn't understand the need to market. I didn't understand, um, really what motivates students at that point. So just a lot I didn't understand. Um, so I've never made that mistake again. So sort of thinking about that, you know, so I've used that example, right? So just sort of think about something that's not just sort of an epic failure, although epic failures can be fine, but what you learn from it. Um, and I've seen people, you know, in interviews sort of, you know, use their coursework, right? You know, you fail that first chemistry exam, you know, and it's like, oh my God, how do you respond to that? You know, you're, you know, you're a chemistry major now or an engineering major now. So obviously you survived chemistry. What did you change in order to be successful later on? 
So the other thing to focus on, and this I think can be, can be a challenge because, you know, especially if you have an interview coming up to focus on improving your communication skills in a short time, it's definitely something to be mindful of. Um, you know, the how you speak of executive presence requires that you continually develop your communication skills. So some of the things to think about. Um, 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 purple crutches, I just used one. Oh, uh, you know, that kind of, you know, I don't know, like those verbal crutches that we use when we don't have an answer or we're thinking through an answer, they may not be obvious to us, but if, especially on a phone interview or a Skype interview where people are just focused on your voice and what you're saying, repeated um, 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 you know, you know, you know, really does stand out. So think about those verbal crutches of yours, what you might say that you're not even noticing that you're doing, but that it's really distracting. Um, mm -hmm. Broaden your small talk, especially if you're doing a long day long interview, you're going to be have several instances to make small talk with people. Don't just constantly say, wow, how about that weather? <laughs> Boy, it's that weather's been crazy. You do that, you do that often Then you suddenly you're asking, you're saying this, you're talking about the weather for the third time with the, you know, the third person, right? So under, you know, uh, stay up on the news, follow the company, have interesting things to say uh, so that when you have the opportunity to make small talk in between interviews or when the receptionist is walking you back to the interview or when the hiring manager is taking you out to lunch, that you come across as interesting, right? All of you are interesting people. I right, just develop that skill. Get control of your voice. Um, now I'm very conscious that I say that a lot. Wow, I need to work on this. People have a tendency, and I think even beyond the voice, people have a tendency to do up speak. So when you're talking at the end of the sentence, when you finish the sentence, instead of finishing with a period, you finish with a question mark. So people are like, did he just ask me a question or did he, was that a statement? Sometimes people have what's vocal fry, so like their voice kind of grinds a bit or they end every sentence with, you know, you know. Uh, a lot of people, I'm totally guilty of this, I talk with my hands. You know, so if you're in an interview, uh, sometimes it's okay to talk with your hands, it seems, you know, expressive. But I've been in interviews where people really talk with their hands um, to the point of almost hitting you. I've been in interviews where people play with their hair a lot or are constantly adjusting with their glasses. So think about those kinds of things that you do that you might not even notice. And quite frankly, on the day to day when you're just hanging out with your friends, no big deal. But in that, that interview situation where people are really focused on you, it can be distracting for them and take away and takes away from your executive presence. Um, and finally, over-prepare. You know, the best way to not say things like, um, right? And not be thrown for a loop and not, not be taken off your game is to really have a sense of what they're going to ask so that your answers are already prepared. Now, this can be hard. One thing I would suggest is to take a look at interview stream. Have any of you guys used interview stream before? This is another one of our really nice resources that Hopkins pays a lot of money for and sticks on Handshake that not as many people use. But it basically is a mock interviewing software where you record yourself giving a mock interview. Now, after you record yourself, you can send that recording to a career coach in the Career Center for Criticisms. But what most people end up doing is looking at it themselves and being horrified at how often they say um or like or they twirl their hair or they don't look pro at the camera or they you know kind of stumble on what the, what they're trying to say so you it's nothing there's nothing like it's it's kind of like when you first listen to yourself a vocal a voice recording and you're like oh my god i sound like that watching yourself recorded doing an interview you're like oh my god i look like that um, but it gives you a chance to understand what an interviewer sees and and to and to work on it I just want to make sure. Okay. 
Ivory, I just got your uh, question. So let me respond to that. Um, so this says in the early example, the answer didn't feel very specific. Former company assignment, is it okay to answer like that? Yeah, that is pretty generic. I think the more specific that you can be, um, the better, especially if you had multiple experiences. Um, and this is an example where stating the company or stating the assignment won't appear to be, uh, you know, that it's always, most of the time it's better to be more specific. Sometimes though, when they say, you know, can you tell me about a time that you had to work with a particularly difficult colleague, you know, and you're, you know, you interned in one division of the company and you're interviewing in a different division of the company, you probably don't want to say, well, yeah, I was working over at accounts receivables and Joe is just awful to work with, right? So sometimes you might want to be a little bit more vague. But for the most part, I think a co comp former company assignment probably is a little bit too vague. You might want to be more specific. Thank you for catching that, Ivory. Did that help? Okay, and then finally, how you look, your appearance. Um, you know, lots of different companies have lots of different dress codes, right? You know, you show up to a tech interview wearing a suit, they're just gonna hit you, right? You know, like, whereas, and if you show up to a finance interview or a consulting interview wearing a hoodie, it's not gonna go far. So different companies have different dress codes and different expectations at how you look. Um, so it's not, you wanna kind of fit, you don't necessarily have to look like a J. Crew model, um, but you do, wanna be a, you do wanna be conscious of what constitutes professional dress at the, at the company that you're interviewing with. You don't want the person on the other side of the table to be better dressed and better put together than you, right? That's usually a good, good advice, right? So think about some of the things, right? So, you know, you always want to be a notch ahead. So if it's a tech, tech company where people wear jeans and hoodies, maybe you wear nice jeans and a nice polo shirt, you know, a little bit above. If it's a company where business casual is normal, dressing in business attire where maybe you're in a sport coat and, and a tie. Um, if people kind of generally wear ties around the office, probably a suit. Right, so you want to be a little bit nice, nicer dressed than than is the company culture. Um, make sure you're, you know, you're well groomed. You know, you're you're clean. Um, you're not wrinkled. You know, your shirt's not always coming undone, right? It's just embarrassing. You know, so all of those things like that. Just sort of be mindful of those things. And it and you know these these general things come across. You know, regardless of your identity or your body type or what you're interviewing, you want to look put together and in control. You don't want your appearance to be distracting and ideally your appearance should sort of enhance who you are. You, you know, we have this, you know, people can look like leaders, you know, how you dress, how you look can enhance what you're saying. You know, people can picture you, oh, I could see this guy or this woman in four years being, being a manager in this company. Looks like a manager, whatever a manager looks like. One last thing to talk about before we do some review and practice. Um, a lot of companies these days are doing Skype interviews. Um, that's becoming more common for a first round doing a phone screen or a Skype interview. We do them here at Hopkins. Um, I've been involved in interview processes for the entire way. I've never actually gone to the company physically. Everything has been by Skype interview. And this is where I hate Skype interviews because if anything can go wrong, it's going to go wrong during a Skype interview. So when you're preparing for a, a video conferencing interview, a Skype interview, make sure everything's working. Um, hopefully your internet doesn't go down, but if you're on Wi-Fi, make sure you're in your good Wi-Fi. Um, use a distraction-free background. You know, if you're at your desk and you're in your, in your room and you have a bunch of pictures or things on the wall, take those down. Have that blank white background. Get proper lighting. There's nothing worse when you're doing an interview and the light's behind you and it's just, you're talking to a shadow. It looks like one of those, you know, like this person's identity has been concealed because, you know, they... Um. So the big thing, so angle and eye contact are key. One thing to keep in mind, this always throws people off. If you're making eye contact with a person on the Skype interview, 
you're actually, from their perspective, it looks like you're looking at their chest, right? Eye contact actually means looking at the, the web camera up front. And that can be hard to do. That's something I think that's worth practicing is when you give your answer to stare at the web camera rather than the person's eyes, right? So that feels to them like you're making eye contact. Um, chest up frame, so you wanna just kind of capture it right there so you're not too far back or it's not just your face taking over their computer screen. Um, Dress appropriately. I think, and I think this is actually true even if you're just doing a phone interview, like wear what you would wear to an interview. Feel prepared. Um, certainly don't be those people who, you know, have on like a dress shirt, you know, dress shirt, tie and coat and no pants, right? Be dressed. Um, and use open body language. Be the same way you'd be in an interview. Yep. I had an interview last week that was supposed to be a phone interview and it switching to FaceTime. Oh, no. So, how common is that, would you say? <laughs> Not common. <laughs> you know, they shouldn't, I mean, having been on both sides, as an interviewer, I, tr I don't want someone to be thrown, unless I'm intentionally trying to throw them. But like, I don't want, <laughs> but like, you know, I don't want them to be thrown, right? I want them to kind of know what they're getting into, know what they're going to meeting. I want them to be their best self, you know? So if they do that, and you're like, oh, switching over to, to FaceTime, you dressed yes. you know like yeah so that, that, that's another reason why it's you know good to sort of be in that be dressed I was in a dress shirt, but still. yeah but like if you're like lying on your bed in your pjs <laughs> you're like oh yeah okay face <laughs> yeah so i mean you know a lot can, and a lot can happen i mean i was doing a, a skype interview um for a, another institution this is several years ago and my internet went down and so I had to, I couldn't do Skype. So I said, you know, can we continue by phone? And this was a day long interview. This was a six hour interview that went down towards the end. And so I actually had, and I didn't get cell service, very good cell service. I was like, you living in a Brooklyn Brownstone apartment. So I had to go outside onto the corner of the street in Brooklyn and con conduct the rest of the interview on the phone, right? I, I didn't get that job. No, no, I didn't get that job. Not surprisingly, but a lot can happen. So the more that you can enter, the more that you can eliminate some of these things, um, the better. All right, we have about 15 minutes. Any, any, any questions? Yeah. What's your favorite strike for a phone minute interview? Like, that's not really enough time to ask any questions, and not enough time to really ask any questions. Like, what So I would say you could probably expect like two minutes of them introducing themselves, the position, the company, kind of telling them something that maybe isn't in the job announcement or some, something like that. Um, might be some general basic questions like why are you interested in the position? Um, what kind of, you know, they might ask three or four very scripted questions that they're just trying to get at how you communicate, whether you are what you seem on paper. Um, and then a chance for maybe a couple minutes for you to ask them questions. Um, oftentimes it could be, or they might be asking very specific questions. So I've done very, very short phone interviews where the, basically the question is, is like, we can only pay X, is that okay? And you're like, yes. <laughs> okay, you'll hear from us later on. Like, or to say, you know, you, you know they, they wanna kind of suss people out. They're getting a lot of really good candidates. They wanna make sure before they move to the next round, that the people that they bring to the next round or put in front of like a hiring manager or a hiring committee, you know, are going to fit with, you know, the expectations are more aligned. Um, so have some basic questions. I doubt that they'll get too technical. Um, I doubt that there'll be too many questions like, oh, can you tell us about, there might not be like, uh, tell me about a time that you failed or some of those deeper behavioral ones. It might just be a couple of basic questions. Yeah. It depends on the company, right? So for some processes, the <clears throat> interview is really just kind of interviewing with a single hiring manager who's making that decision. Um, in this case, this is common at universities. You know, you meet with 
you know, your colleagues and you meet with your boss and you meet with your boss's boss and then you meet with the dean and then you meet with, you know, 15 other people and then you meet with students and then you come back and meet with the search committee again. So it's easy to, to wreck that up. I know people who have interviewed at tech companies and gone through like six rounds of interviews have flown out twice to companies to, to meet with different people. Um, you know, and if they're flying you out there, they're probably going to want to talk to you more than a half hour. So you might meet with different different divisions. Some of it might be very hard, specific questions. Some of it might just be like, oh, could you work with this person? You know, or this is a chance for you to ask questions of people who have gone through this program or worked in this division. Um, so the longer the interview, the longer it does take to prepare. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so we're actually working on a salary negotiation workshop, which we're gonna offer later on. The key to the salary is to put it off as long as possible, right? So if they say, oh, you know, what kind of salary were you expecting for this position? You say, well, you know, I, I would expect a salary that's in line with my skills and experience. Or, you know, right now I'm just, I, I'm just trying to get a sense of whether this is a good fit for me and I wanna learn more about the company and hope to give you an opportunity to learn more about me. And there's gonna be plenty of time to discuss salary later. Right? Because the whole idea is you want them to make the first offer. You want them to say, we'd love to have you. We'd offer you $75,000. And then you can come back and say, you know, these skills, <laughs> you know, at least 100, right? So that's the, that's the thing with salary negotiations, not get boxed in. You know, because if they say, what were you expecting for salary? You're like, you say, well, 100? <laughs> <laughs> so it's just you want to you want to avoid it. And there's we, there's tips you can get online. We're gonna offer another workshop, but hopefully, especially early on, they you know come. It's even at you know like some states like Massachusetts, companies can't ask you for your salary at a previous place. So it's kind of it's it's somewhat frowned upon, even though you want to give companies as little information as possible about your salary. Same thing when you're applying for the job. If you're asked for what your salary is or your salary expectation, you can say negotiable or give a range. That is a very awkward question. Not yours, but the being asked. <laughs> All right, let's practice a bit. We have 